Can we get the slide? Yep. How about that? How about that? Guys, thanks so much for uh, for sticking to the end. Uh, we've obviously saved the, the the best for last here, right, Megan? Oh yes. <laughs> so I wish I dressed up. <laughs> How do you follow that act? Very very hard, very hard to do that. But uh, so now that we actually have the uh, slide about what is creativity, what you know, let's let's kind of ask each other what what we think creativity is from 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 our pers sure. perspective. So that's a formal definition, but. Um, a simpler way of putting it is uh, creativity is a skill within us. It's um, a way of being that uses all of our senses to uh, sidestep what's not working to do or make something better. It's our innate way of knowing, innate ability to know. And uh, I love John Cleese's definition, but I would take it one step further and say, Creativity is our human operating system because it accesses all domains of knowing for good sake. Yeah. What, do you, what would you say? Well, I would say, you know, for me, it's, that's, that's, that's perfect. Human operating system, essentially, uh, um, creativity is imagination mm -hmm. that's untethered from any of our uh, assumptions that we have right. about uh, life or, or work or anything that we do. So it's, I think it's an opportunity to be completely, totally um, uh, you know, certainly in the clouds. And, uh, you know, that, that is the ultimate goal of creativity is to tapping into that potential to build something that, is, that has substantial meaning. Mm -hmm. That's what we're, we're going to talk about today. So let's, let's start with your story, Megan. I mean, you've, uh, you know, we've, we've known each other uh, for a while, so I, I, I certainly know your story, but why don't you share it with the rest of the group here? Okay. Uh, so my background is film. I was a documentary and educational filmmaker. Uh, and in 97, I got hired at Her Interactive as creative director. Um, and two years later, uh, with no warning, I became CEO. And it happened in a board meeting. The original CEO resigned, and they looked at me and said, we think you can do it. And that's how I got the job. Um, I had no formal uh, management, technical, or um, financial training. I was raised creatively, so I led that way. And we went from zero to 8.5 million in revenues. We sold 9 million games, uh, created a new market niche, and uh, for a decade, we enjoyed inspired employees and customers, consecutively award-winning games, um, yearly revenue growth, and for a long time, very little competition. And um, it wasn't until I left Her Interactive uh, two years ago, after 15 years, that I understood how we did it, how we defied the odds in an unwelcoming environment, first of all, and with a totally unconventional CEO. And I realized it was because we went against the grain. We sidestepped the system uh, and um, basically uh, redesigned it. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was because we bucked the system. We, um, we took risks, which I think was really important, to do what was necessary for a higher purpose. And we knew it was the right thing to do, and we were determined to make it happen. So let's talk about some of the risks that you took uh, that, that, let, that made you lead creatively. Um, or maybe as a result of leading creatively, yeah. those, those risks. So one of them was uh, when, I, when I began, I was instructed uh, that I was to serve at the pleasure of the board, and I decided to also serve at the pleasure of the customers and the audience, uh, because that actually worked out really well. And um, the other was that, you know, the system didn't include us, so we re redesigned it. Uh, we weren't welcome in retail, so... What we did is find somebody to teach us how to publish on Amazon, and we, got, we backdoored it into retail. So as soon as our sales started taking off, the um, publishers came back and we got a deal in retail. Then when we got into retail, uh, we realized the publishers were making the lion's share of the profit, so we did the same thing. We got someone to teach us how to publish in retail, and that's when, our, uh, that's when it took off for us. Oh, that's great. That's great. So, 
so let's let's talk about kind of the ways that you led your team creatively. What are the th some of the things that happened along the way that uh, that kind of challenged and maybe encouraged you? Right. Well, I had a background in film, and it was creative collaboration. So I was uh, more of a co-creator and a collaborator than a decider and an overseer. Um, I hired business people who respected the creative process. Uh, and I led with the values of creativity, which are uh, open-mindedness, uh, curiosity, that first and foremost, uh, kindness, uh, respect for diverse uh, people and perspectives, uh, risk-taking in the face of uncertainty. And uh, I told people what I knew and I didn't know, and no one really needed to know everything, uh, because actually that would have uh, ruined the positive flow. And, and it was so palpable uh, that girls who came for tours, which we did very often, they would very often leave and say, I want to work at Her Interactive. No, that's very interesting. So, so you know, as, as we're, you know, we're at a business con uh, conference, so that translates into, into money. Now, you know, how did that uh, apply to Nancy Drew Gaines? What are the, some of the assumptions that were broken as a, as a result of this type of thinking, and, and how did that kind of drive the, you know, drive the opportunity with Nancy Drew. For making meaning? Yeah. 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 Um, so we didn't want to make just a fun game. We wanted to make a game that inspired girls to lead, which is consistent with, you know, Nancy Drew, who inspired generations of women. And uh, so we fused entertainment and education in such a fun way they didn't even know they were learning. And we integrated cultural and historical references uh, to uh, expand their imaginations of what was possible and also what had been done. And um, you know, we also uh, would have girls come for tours regularly, and then you know, we get like six or seven people to drop what they were doing and have conversations with the girls. And to you know, if she can see it, she can be it. And really, they left a foot taller. I mean, they came in kind of, you know, not really very confident, and they left realizing this is something I could do. And the other great thing was we, over the decade, we got thousands and thousands of testimonials from the girls saying they were so inspired by the games that they went on to become scientists, cryptologists, detectives. We had a NASA engineer who volunteered to be a moderator. Uh, and it was on and on and on. And that fueled our pride. And we, it made us want to do it over and over again. No, so, no, that's interesting. And we talk about meaning. That is the highest meaning of all, when yeah. you can inspire somebody and have a life-changing right. uh, right. life thing for them. But we, we do, you know, one of the things that happens is that, you know, as, as game developers, we do make a certain set of assumptions about our audiences. And, oh, yeah. You know, right. we, certainly do, we certainly did that um, you, back in the dawn did, of did, casual did games. You did yeah, that? yeah, of yeah. course. Uh, you know, when we thought, okay, well, you know, casual games are all about games like Bejeweled. Uh, right. but, uh, but I think it takes, uh, it takes a certain amount of bravery to buck that trend. We did that with games like Tradewinds and Westward. And I know, you know, these assumptions that you've, you've encountered, you know, uh, you know, I think you, you've been talking about how. Uh, specifically with Nancy Drew, so it'll be curious if you kind of uh, uh, hit those same uh, same set of uh, uh, set of assumptions. Yeah, we yeah. did the same thing. I mean, we assumed that you know the target audience was girls nine through thirteen, which you know growing up that that was who usually read the books, and that was true. Except actually, when we got the the Nancy Drew license, it was dead. Uh, so we had to actually revitalize it. And what happened is, uh, what surprised us is the mothers bought the games for their daughters to inspire them as they were inspired as kids, and then the moms got hooked on the games. And then they gave the, the games to their moms, and so it became a cross-generational ph phenomenon. Uh, and, you know, we had an audience we didn't even expect. So, you know, it really, um, made us realize that you know the games were challenging enough for a wide range and entertaining so yeah we we that was a big surprise for us yeah no i, I think assumptive thinking leads to ah that's exactly yeah, right yeah leads to that kind of the feeling of uh, okay well it's it's the same old same old look folks we see that in our industry as well and wouldn't you agree megan now that you know we've got mobile games that address uh, a target market in which 
you know, large public uh, uh, game companies address that really well, or historically have addressed it really well. What they're trying to do is essentially a one plus uh, that experience and not really think too far outside of the box to generate some of the, the, the new types of, types of content. Whereas really kind of unleashing that larger creative process could lead them into, into possibly creating uh, experiences that are, that are far more, um, that can generate far more profitable products for them in the, in, in the future. Totally. So. Here's one, one example of yep. that. When we um, were making games for girls, uh, we were advised if you're going to make games for girls, make them pink and they'll all come. Uh, we made them unpink and they all came. Uh, the idea, the stereotypes are limiting revenue opportunities and you know, it's also giving a dulling effect of, of what it is to be human and, and just we're missing out on new market niches and genres. I mean, you know, it's so imperative that we start expanding our perspectives and views of uh, all of us. There are as many perspectives as there are people and we're only tapping a few. Yeah, and what's interesting is, you know, more, more so than any other time in the history of uh, business or industry, we've got a diverse workforce. And for the most part, uh, you know, you look at the product coming out of that uh, diverse workforce and it is pretty plain vanilla. Right, so there's there's that kind of dulling down of right. that, and and you know the the the, the hes hesitation to make risks to continue that kind of arbitrage equation of cost of acquisition versus lifetime value leads to very uninspired decision making, Correct. and uh, you know which is which is interesting. So you know kind of what is the difference in what you've seen in the industry between how we lead today and and what really an inspired leadership would be all about? Well. Uh, creative leadership encourages what's possible uh, and uh, creative leadership uh, requires that we lead with creative intelligence which is sensing, intuiting, imagination, uh, um, feeling, uh, perceiving and supported by analytical intelligence which is logical, linear, linear and literal thinking and traditional leadership leads with analytical intelligence uh, which may or may not be supported by creative intelligence. And creativity has been you know, dismissed and, and really underestimated. Uh, it's usually relegated to making art or products. Uh, and I, I, it's because it hasn't been, uh, you know, the value hasn't been quantified, but that's no longer the case. The science of creativity has been proven. Yeah, there's lots of studies and, and, and academic journals that really focus on, right. on that. Yeah. Um, but and, also, and you know, whether you call it conscious leadership or facilitative or right. creative, the, the basic tenets are the same. But also it's reflected in industry, you know, the, the inspired companies. One that comes to mind is, is PopCap pre, you know, pre-EA acquisition. It's, uh, it's a company that, had, that was very, very inspired. They created products that were completely outside of the box. Right. You know, they trying to find similarity between Plants vs. Zombies and Bejeweled right. uh, is, is, is very difficult. It's, it's, it's a fully uh, out of the box thinking type of environment and, uh, and the market uh, really, as they redo, uh, redefine themselves multiple times in their history, the market really, uh, 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 I guess, accepted and, and rewarded them uh, for their ability to, to innovate creatively. And you know Google is another example, right? Yeah. So they've got a, uh, you know, they they for for a long time and maybe even still they've got you know you work on your own personal project for a day, uh, and and completely uh, untethered to whatever else is happening in, in corporate priority. So what does that lead to, right? What that leads to, uh, really tapping is into those diverse voices to create that really fantastic experience that couldn't have been done if it was. Uh, uh, being driven from top down. That's right. Yeah. Um, so what happens if we don't lead this way? What, we don't change the way that we, we lead. What happens if we just keep that kind of hierarchical structure associated with leadership? Well, first, it's uh, financial. We're, we're missing out on revenue opportunities, uh, new market niches, new audiences. Uh, it's, um, it doesn't make sense. Uh, and next is the breadth of, you know, original stories and, and wide-ranging characters that we're still missing is really leaving a dulling effect on us. It is 
uh, it leaves us with um, a simplistic and a homogenistic view of what it is to be human. Uh, creativity is the most important skill set in the 21st century and the most valuable uh, leadership advantage we can employ. And uh, I was thinking the other day, you know, we upgrade our computers when they're not ma functioning at their maximum capacity. Why wouldn't we do the same with ourselves? Yeah. No, exactly. It, you know, when you look at the industry overall, you've got you know games such as Monument Valley that are relegated to toward that indie category, mm -hmm. and they, you know, they don't see the light of day uh, from perspective of well, let's let's actually figure out exactly what's going on and why uh, a game such as this has such incredible broad market appeal. Uh, and so what happens is I think a lot of the the indie games are being denigrated. Uh, and being just labeled, okay, they're just they're just indies, they're one-offs, they're never gonna, you know, that that's not a model that's sustainable, that's never gonna work. We're gonna focus on the things that we've done before, and that leads to that kind of dulling, uh, chasing that uh, what we call in the investment business that red ocean effect that you have right now in the games industry. That's right, and I think you know the past few years have been such a wake-up call for all of us. Um, you know, leadership determines uh, the quality of our leadership determines the quality of our workplaces our cultures and the media products we interact with uh, and uh, you know I think it's time to do things differently um, leadership is behavior and people need to be inspired not managed because inspiration uh, is what brings us meaning through our deepest values and you know that gives us the meaningful purpose to innovate for good sake. Um, now, in, in the diversity, uh, diversity panel, you actually talked about, the, uh, talked about unconscious bias at UCB and, and the effect of unconscious bias on, on dulling, that, that dulling that, perspective, that ability for us to, 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 to create, um, uh, create these inspired products and right. think, think outside of the box. Right. So how does that unconscious bias and the, and the inherent assumptive thinking associated with, with, uh, uh, with that, how does that really hold us back from, from having not only diversity in leadership, but also in diversity in thinking and, and uh, inspiration and product? Um, it's a big question. <laughs> yeah, okay. Before I say that, I just wanted to say one thing. I, I really predict that those companies who do not invest in creative leadership in the next five years will lose market share to those who do. Yeah. And it's linked to unconscious bias because leading with the values of creativity uh, diminishes the unconscious bias. It dissolves the fear and it makes us more self-aware, which is the first step in actually embodying our full human potential and leading with our best selves. And then once we're inspired, we inspire others because behavior is contagious. So getting to unconscious bias, unconscious bias is a, is, a, is a blind spot. It's a bad habit we all have. And it prevents us from uh, letting go of our perceived notions to uh, expand our imaginations, to welcome diverse people and perspectives. And, uh, and because it's unconscious, we often don't realize we have it. And what's worse, uh, we think we're right. And, uh, and so it requires uh, raising our awareness to positively shift our behavior. Um, mindfulness techniques are a first step uh, to make that perceptual and experiential shift. And um, you know, when we are fully present, uh, we connect with rather than uh, have bias towards others. Uh, in other words, we inspire ourselves so we can inspire others. So they're, you know, right now they're great starts at eradicating unconscious bias, but I don't think they are it. I think some of them are band-aids, like quotas, you know, or, ban or um, taking an unconscious bias course. Now that's, um, a, they're great steps, but that's more informational. It has to be you know, on a daily basis, and it has to be intentional that we're thinking about our thoughts so we can start to change them so our behavior is different. And then we can welcome diverse content, diverse leaders, diverse thinkers, and then all of us will be collaborating together. And I think our time is up. Yeah. 
Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Left hand.